speaking of gaps, the person who's going to be talking about the gap um, is the co-founder and president of our association, Dr. Perry Hoffman. Perry has flown down from New York to be with us because it's that important. We are doing regional GAP conferences throughout the country and internationally. We've had one in Israel. We have one in San Juan, not international, but it's a territory. We had the first one three years ago at the University of Houston. So she is a strong advocate and proponent. And I've known Terry for, Perry for about seven, eight years. And I can tell you, when she gets locked into something, she is like a little pit bull dog. She doesn't let go. Um, she is absolutely bringing this, this whole issue of early prevention and intervention of BPD to a global stage. And uh, let me give just a little background on Perry, because she's a very approachable, humble, genuine, down-to-earth person. But I got to tell you, she's a bit of a rock star in the mental health community. Perry is well known nationally and internationally for being an advocate of borderline personality disorder awareness and family involvement, to the point where she's actually, with a colleague of hers, done research of the need for family emotional involvement with BPD relatives. NEA BPD, which she founded, co founded uh, 16 years ago, is all volunteer. We are actually international now. We have, we have Family Connections classes and leaders in conferences in places like Italy, Scandinavia, uh, the UK, Australia, and growing. She's going to be doing a conference in Russia, she tells me. Uh, so we are getting around the world very quickly with our message. Um, she, uh, she's had several grants from the National Institute of Mental Health with a focus on families and relatives of BPD. She's conducted this landmark study, which we actually refer to in our Family Connections classes, documenting the importance of family emotional involvement in BPD patient recovery, meaning that there are actually better outcomes for patients with borderline uh, with family involvement, even if it's not totally positive and productive family involvement, than without family involvement. She's a co-designer of our 12-week Family Connections class. And she uh, and, and it is available in many locations. Unfortunately, demand exceeds supply. The supply are volunteer leaders like myself, Bill, Jean, Hayari, uh, Tina, and Kathy, and others, and Dot. Um, we do some of our classes by telephone because we have to. We try to reach people in places where there are just very few resources for them and they are desperate and struggling. And we find that our, even our telephone classes have a huge positive impact. Uh, she is a co-editor with Dr. John Gunderson at McLean Psychiatric, who's pretty much retired now. Do most of you know the name John Gunderson? He's considered the father of BPD. He is one of the recognized leaders in bringing it to awareness and in working with clinicians and mental health professionals in educating them on the newest, latest research of borderline personality disorder. So she's a co-editor with him on two books. One is Understanding and Treating Borderline Personality Disorder, A Guide for Professionals and Family Members. And her latest book is Beyond Borderline. You can find it on Amazon, True Stories of Recovery from Borderline Personality Disorder. Um, Perry is well recognized in what she does as an advocate for BPD. She was recognized by NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, in 2011 with an Excellence in Community Mental Health Award. And in 2012, she was recognized by the American uh, Psychiatric Association and received its Distinguished Service Award in recognition of contributions in the field of American psychi uh, psychiatry. So she plays the role of advocate, teacher, author, a clinician, she kind of does it all. Uh, and with that, I'm going to let Perry talk to you about bridging the gap. Help me in welcoming her. Good morning, and thank you for coming. And thank you, for Susan, for pulling off this conference. She mentioned something to me about nine months ago when she heard about the gap, and boom, she makes it happen. So thank you, and thank you to um, Skyland Trails for all the work that they've done, for Kathy, who had to learn some new programs to make sure we registered people right, the Milkies, Dot Keith, I mean, Tina, I mean, all the people who really made an effort to make this happen. So thank you, and it's just an honor to be here. So let me first start 
I'm, I'm a Mac user, so I'm a little tenuous with this computer. Let me tell you a little bit of first about our organization. So as Susan said, we are about 16 years old. And we started because several of us were at a conference at Rockefeller University, where um, Dr. Alan Francis casually mentioned something about NAMI not taking BPD under its mission umbrella, which was just such a surprise to me. I had always assumed that NAMI was, um, was working with BPD communities. So when I had lunch with some family members who were there, we decided, well, maybe we should meet and try to do something. So um, that meeting was in July. We then all met in August, which was three weeks before 9-11. And we decided, well, let's try to do something that's going to make a difference with this disorder. And that was the beginning of what we wanted to do with any ABPD. We came up with the name. We decided that we'd host a conference. We held a conference uh, 2002 at Columbia University. It was, there were over 450 people there. And that was sort of the beginning of us beginning to build some credibility and also begin to pull in an audience of people who had been waiting for something to be done. Since that first conference, then we applied for a grant to the National Institute of Mental Health health, and they gave us a grant to host five conferences. Well, because we're all volunteer, um, and they are generous in what they do for each conference, we were, um, we did a, all the manpower was done by, on a volunteer basis. So we managed to take those five years of funding and parlay it into about 25 conferences. And then we applied for another few years of grant, um, and we got three years, and so that we parlayed into about another 15 conferences. So about 35 to 45 of our conferences have had NIMH money, but in large part because someone like Trish Woodward, who was one of our co-founding members, did so much on her time and on her back without any money coming in. So that was the beginning of us be, being able to do conferences. Since then, we... Um, have published three books, Susan mentioned two. And our sort of our hallmark um, and what people know us most for is family connections. And I will be talking a little bit about that, and then we'll have some family connections leaders come up and join us. But I, I do have to remark how far this disorder has come. So I was part of the first people to be trained in DBT, and um, that was on the East Coast. Dr. Charlie Swenson went to Seattle. He was the first person to take DBT out of Seattle, and he brought it to New York Hospital, where I was working with him. And so in about the mid, mid 1990s, we started to go around and do some lectures on DBT. We, we were not that seasoned yet, but we were better than anything else because no one else knew anything. So when I remember going to a presentation at, in Connecticut and asking people, how many of you have heard of DBT? And not one hand went up. So to think now, there was, in this audience, every hand went up. I think that speaks to also where this disorder has come. DBT has changed the landscape. Um, and I'll, I'll go into a little more about what that has done is specifically. So that's who NEA is. We've also uh, started about three years ago um, started to think about the people being under 18 and the importance of recognizing this disorder, that it, it's a myth to say that you cannot diagnose anyone under 18. And I'll show you some graphs that come off our website that show that people who are looking for help are younger than 18. So um, we had gotten some money from Brandon Marshall, and those of you who are football players might know who he is. So we decided to host a, a luncheon and invite about 25 leading BPD experts, um, along with the American Psychiatric Association Conference. And at that meeting, we developed the idea of GAP, which is this idea of early prevention and intervention. And the two people who really are key in this are Dr. Carla Sharp in Houston and Dr. Andrew Chain in, in Australia. And then there's some wonderful up and coming, I wouldn't even say up and coming stars, they are stars, people like Stephanie Stepp. But their work is focused on under 18. So with that, this gap now started. Um, and I will go through what GAP is doing. But I just want to make sure you're clear, it's not another organization. It's a collaboration of efforts of people in different organizations, agencies, individuals, whomever, who want to make sure that this news gets out, that this disorder occurs well under the age of 18. 
So this is what the GAP set as its goals, is to promote early detection and timely intervention for BPD, to match treatments to individual development and to phase and stage of treatment, to work with families at all stages of intervention, and this is my passion. I don't know how you can treat someone with this disorder, which is a disorder that happens in relationships and not involve the families. Improve access to evidence-based treatments. Increase variety of available treatments across all levels of the health system. Develop a mental health workforce updating knowledge, culture, and practice. Address problems of stigma from both individual and family perspectives. And integrate service user advocacy in the above aims. So I think this is also in the book that you got. But just to give you a summary, because uh, this is, it's, I fleshed it out so it's more concise than, than the language we've used. So what has happened so far, and again, this is a collaboration of effort. We've published the first position paper on BPD in youth, and you can find that on our website. Our website is very easy to remember. It's borderlinepersonalitydisorder.com. Um, we host regional conferences to disseminate information on youth. We also, the um, NEA BPD has an official journal that we were invited to participate in. We don't actually do all that much, um, but it's called BPD and Emotion Regulation. And what we now have up on that journal, which is an online journal, you can go online and you can just pull down the articles. There's no subscriptions or anything. We now have a special section on, on youth, and Dr. Carla Sharp is the editor on that. We will be starting, we have on our website the archives of about 75 call-ins. We do a weekly Sunday night call-in where we have special speakers who will talk on different aspects of BPD. We have handouts that go along with it. And starting in September, this call-in series, which we're going to convert actually to a podcast, is going to focus totally on BPD and under age 18. So those of you who've registered for the conference, unless you don't want to be on the list for an announcement of how to sign on, um, let me know. But otherwise, I'll take this mailing list and make sure you're all on it so you know when we're starting. <coughs> Another thing that we've done, and I'm so also so excited about this, is that we had one of Dr. Carla Sharp's students go through the references from 1982 of anything written on BPD in youth. So there are actually over 500 articles, and those references will be on our website. We actually have the articles, but I'm told that we'll be sued for copyright if we post them. But anyhow, maybe some way we can figure out to work with the journals, because it's just a, a richness of watching the history of what's happened from 1982 to, 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 to date. Um, we will be de developing a training syllabus for mental health professionals. Um, very key also is that institutions will be working together to do research studies together. You know, it's very nice when one lab in one state's doing one thing and another lab's doing another. But when you combine these labs together, you get much more power and much more information. So again, this is a collaboration of efforts to get researchers to work together. And then the last thing, um, just to fill you in on, is that um, when we went to the National NAMI Convention in June, several of us went to visit some of our representatives of Congress, Congress and some who were not our representative. But we met with um, Rep representative Grace Napolitano's office. She's from California. She's head of the Mental Health Caucus. And we asked her representative, who was an amazing <coughs> young man, if they would consider holding a congressional briefing on youth and suicide and self-injury. Ten years ago, NEA held a congressional briefing, which is what led to May being declared mental, um, May is um, BPD Awareness Month. So we're not sure what will come of this, but we want to we want to educate people that suicide and self-injury under 18 is a crisis, and we need help doing that. And what was so nice to see on Thursday night, I got um, a Google alert that now uh, 
Representative Napolitano's office has started a task force on suicide prevention. So it's very nice for us that we have this congressional briefing. They've started this task force, and hopefully some energy will come and some, some changes will come on recognizing it, this. So let me just quickly give you a background on borderline personality disorder. I see that probably half the people are family members. Knowing the way family members are today, you're probably very well educated. When um, in, in the early, in the late 1990s, I made up a little sticky note and I put it on my computer and I wrote, need a fact sheet on borderline personality disorder. Because way back then, if you would go on the internet, what you found was so depressing and so hopeless. And that's unfortunately what still remains somewhat on the internet. But the um, families back then didn't have accurate information. I think they do now, but I just want to, um, also, to tell you, first of all, that this is a disorder of controversies. Age is not the only issue that's been controversial. The validity of the disorders has been controversial. It was thought to perhaps be a variant of a mood disorder or even schizophrenia. Um, one a therapist or clinician called it a wastebasket diagnosis. So, of course, if you do that, you're not going to get anything um, to move forward. The prognosis, historically it was seen as a lifelong illness with a poor prognosis and the patients were termed as treatment resistant. What doesn't go on this line was that many years ago there wasn't treatment for people with borderline personality disorder. So someone would go in for treatment um, and they were called treatment resistant because they actually was no treatment. So this whole, you can see how this stigma built up over the years. Actually now we call it the good prognosis diagnosis because people get better. Unlike other mental illnesses, people get out of the mental health system. Um, I must get at least two calls a week, either from a parent or someone with a disorder, saying we've just been told this is borderline personality disorder. And my response is I hope that's what it is because if it is, you or your loved one will get out of the mental health system. You'll get better. Depression is lifelong. It may be you'll have, there'll be long gaps um, between relapses. Schizophrenia is lifelong. Bipolar is lifelong. Borderline personality disorder is not. The name, there has been a lot of controversy on that name. Um, it's pejorative, we know that. It's stigmatizing, it's outdated, um, and I won't go into how it got started, but it's no longer relevant. The issue, though, in trying to do a name change takes a lot of effort, um, and some people have said, you know what, we have more important things to do. We've got to work on better treatments, we've got to work on building awareness, so nobody's really taken on a um, head-on about a name change. And the last thing is blame. Parents were seen as key in the development of the disorder. And with that, the stigmatization continues. And we know that parents are not to blame. We do know that things have happened in the environment, but we know that they, the children grow up in many different environments. They grow up in school environments, and we know bullying now is actually has a label 30 years ago. I don't think we were talking about it. We know what happens, um, houses of worship, I'm sad to say. Um, so there's a lot that happens in an environment, and we do know that people with the disorder have had traumas. Um, but there are also a lot of people who've been traumatized who de don't develop a psychiatric disorder. So we need to stop blaming families. We need to learn how to help families because they really are on the front line and are the, fr the first responders in many ways. So just in terms, I'm going to run through just the words that are underlined um, in terms of the criteria. Um, abandonment, which is the number one and most prevalent symptom. Unstable and intense relationships. Unstable self-image or sense of self. Impulsivity. Suicidal behaviors. <coughs> affective instability. Chronic feelings of emptiness, and this will come up again in a few slides. Intense anger paranoid ideation, or severe dissociative symptoms. So you need five out of the nine to meet criteria for BPD, but you can have one or two and your life can be hell. So I think when we, we think about five, we're looking at the wrong end of the, of, the, of the issue. We need to look at the symptoms and understand that that's where the, the trouble is, not five out of nine. 
So my colleague, Dr. Alan Frizzetti, put this together. And if, if there ever is a name change, probably one of high contenders will be emotion dysregulation. And we actually start talking more about emotion dysregulation because if people haven't gotten the diagnosis yet, they understand that. And it's a way of them identifying for what we will be talking about. So these are the different things that happen with emotion dysregulation. There's low self-esteem, problems in relationships, anxiety, fears of abandonment, problems in thinking and problem solving, self-judgments, attempts to avoid or numb, and impulsive behaviors. So I know all of you have some um, connection to the BPD community, so I'm sure that you can re relate to each one of these circles in some way um, how these things play out in one's life. So now I just want to um, present some facts on BPD and, te and teens. I'm not, I mean, I could ask, is there anyone in the room who thinks that this diagnosis doesn't start under 18? No, and for those of you not seeing the hands, not one hand went up. Okay, so let me give you some facts because you might have to persuade people that actually this is important for us to be pushing. So BPD behaviors can be normal and can also be symptoms. So we know that 20 to 30% of healthy teens drink alcohol, drive with someone under the influence of alcohol, binge eat, fight, shoplift, self-harm, experience suicide, excuse me, suicidality. But 80% of teens do not engage in these behaviors on a regular basis. Okay, and that's one of the issues that people say. Well, so much of this is normal adolescence, and that's true, but it's or normal adolescence to an extreme. And so when these things have a pattern and stay for a period of time, then you know there's a problem. Fact, key psychiatric guidelines in several countries identify BPD in teens. So um, although people will say that this isn't accurate, it is. The DSM-5, which is our sort of Bible for psychiatric diagnoses, actually does say under 18, although people say that it doesn't. But I should have brought the page number. But, um, the Australia sees it um, under 18. The, um, the ICD-11, which is the European classification for psychiatric diagnoses, says that it happens under 18. So it's across many countries that this is a diagnosis under 18. And by, by and large, they report BPD onset between puberty and emerging adulthood. But I would bet that any parent who has a child with BPD, or an adult, a, you know, a child who's now been diagnosed, will say, I saw this when they were a child. And um, we have a wonderful, powerful presentation from uh, Susan's sister, Debbie, where she talks about her experience as a mom. And she said, you know what? I never knew that socks had bumpy, had, were bumpy. She said, but I should have seen that that was something. There was a sensitivity there that when I put on my child's socks, she would complain that the socks were uncomfortable. And I hear from constantly from moms and dads saying, you know what? If um, it, w there was, a, there was um, something that would happen at home, there was conflict in relationships, this child seemed to always be in the middle. Their sensitivity was not appreciated by other people in the family. And so there was a spiral that would happen in the system. And I'll show you some of our research off our website. And the symptoms are best understood and explained by BPD. And actually, BPD in adolescents looks similar to BPD in adults. So those nine criteria that we ran through, you find them in adolescents. They, they, it's not a, all of a sudden at 18, happy birthday, you have BPD. They are very much evident um, at a much younger age. So fact, BPD does not have to be a chronic illness nor treatment resistant. There's excellent treatment out there. People who get it move on. It's a highly treatable disorder, but early prevention is crucial and critical. The data show that evidence-based treatment for BPD in youth have been effective. So DBT has been modified to work with in adolescents. I know mentalization has their own uh, adaptation for teens. Um, so let's think about this. Perhaps it's stigmatizing not to label an adolescent with, B with BPD. 
And BPD is underreported, so I think this is interesting, so follow it if you can with me. In, generals, in general, clinicians in practice report personality disorders at 28%. Okay, but the standard assessments by psychologists when they're test doing assessments reported at 75%. You, so you can see the difference between what clinicians will identify versus what standardized tests will identify. The agreement on validity of personality disorder diagnosis is at 58% versus the use of personality disorder diagnosis at 9%. Look at that big difference, 58% to 9%. And the agreement on validity of BPD in adolescents is at 82% versus the use of the diagnosis in adolescents at 23%. Big difference. It's out there, but people are not using it. So the bottom line, it's more stigmatizing to ignore that an adolescent has the disorder or traits of the disorder. It's more stigmatizing to avoid appropriate treatments because a diagnosis is not made. It's stigmatizing to give a wrong diagnosis, wrong treatment, unnecessary medication. And this is my big one. A lot of kids are being di diagnosed as early bipolars. We need to take a look at that. In adults, up to 40% of adults diagnosed with bipolar have borderline personality disorder. And I contacted one of the researchers on this. I said, did you ever look at this in adolescence? And he said, no. He said, but I think you're on to something. We need to be looking at that. So this may also be happening in teens. So a question is, where else is a diagnosis with, with, withheld from the patient or family? I can't think of anything else. <laughs> Benefits of early intervention. More likely the symptoms will not become entrenched and chronic if we can get to them early. It offers the opportunity to build coping skills that compensate for deficits. This is a disorder of deficits. It's not a disorder of conflict, which is what it was previously thought at. Teens can change more easily than adults. Teens learn things much quicker than adults do. So why are we waiting to get into adulthood to try to uh, modify somebody's um, challenges? What other illness, medical or psychiatric, do we think intervention, later intervention is better? I don't think we could name one to say, you know what, let's hold off. Let's hold, hold off on cancer treatment. Later is better. There's nothing where later is better. So what does early prevention look like? Well, first we have to need the need to distinguish between normalcy and pathology. And we went through that slide of what is normal. But again, if it lasts for a period of time, it's pathology, it's not normal. We need to identify high-risk behaviors. Even the th sub-threshold of BPD traits are a problem. They, again, we don't need to be wedded to those five out of nine. We need to involve parents, school personnel, peers, and pediatricians. Those are who are seeing what's going on. Family members do, but I think family members sometimes are so like deers in headlights that they don't even know what's going on. Although I must say, anytime I've gotten a call from a parent saying, I think my child has BPD, they've never been wrong. Spouses sometimes are wrong, which is interesting. Sometimes I got a call from a spouse who says, I think my wife has BPD. <laughs> Turns out we're not sure where the diagnosis really fits. But, but parents are, by and large, know pretty well. Pediatricians, I'd love to get them involved, but I think they see the child once a year, and the child talks their way out of cuts on their arm, the cat or this and that. I think our real key people also are the school personnel, and I'm so glad that some of you are here, because that's where we need to intervene in the schools. And I also think a rich resource are peers. Peers know more than most people do. And if we can get in and help them understand that their, their friend is in trouble, we maybe can move this forward. I know there's one school in Greenwich I was so impressed to hear that they have one person designated as the person that the high school kids should come to if they see someone in trouble. So they know exactly where to go. They know it's confidential. And that key person knows how to then start the ball rolling on what needs to be done. So maybe other schools would think of that idea. Um, and we need to teach coping skill strategies for teens. And finally, we need to provide psychoeducation and skills training for parents. 
So what is the prevalence of BPD under 18? So it's about 1 to 3 percent in community samples. That means just out in the community. It's 11 to 22 percent in outpatient therapy. And it's 33 to 49 percent in inpatients. And up to 49 percent of kids who kill themselves have traits of BPD. What's the age of onset as individuals report their own symptoms? So this is excerpts from this uh, book that Dr. Gunderson and I edited. We have 25 stories in there. The first time I tried to kill myself, I was 10 years old. Another one said, it all began in high school. I felt like an outsider and a young girl who didn't quite fit in with her peers. Another one said, my therapist told me she had suspected all along that I had borderline personality disorder, but couldn't diagnose me until I was 18. Finally, I had an identity. And I would also predict with the social media and what these kids are exposed to 24 hours a day. I mean, most of us, I think, can remember in, being in high school and maybe there were some challenges there socially or academically or whatever. But at least we could go home and we'd be in the sort of the safe place of our homes. We weren't intruded on 24 hours a day. But the kids on their phones with Instagram watching what party they weren't invited to, or things that are said on Facebook, or, I mean, I think that we're going to see more of what we would call invalidating environments, and that's one of the things that leads to BPD. So I think we need to be aware of that. So what do parents identify as the age of onset? And these are taken from our website. So when people sign up, um, this is from a study that Dr. Melanie Harnett out of Marsha Linehan's lab um, Alan Frizzetti, who's the co-designer of Family Connections, and I did off our website. And I'll explain to you more about the study because I think it's equally important. But I was very curious to see at what age did the family member identify their relative had BPD. And you can see how it just spikes starting at age 11 and then comes down and goes back up. But this is what family members identify when BPD starts. And this has taken off our registration forms. People register for our Family Connections program on our website. And we ask them, what's the age of your ill relative? And you can see how it's skewed to the left. I mean, it's, it's, um, it starts at about 12 and goes all the way up to adolescence and then starts to go down. But we know that this is what's happening out there. And this is another. Um, research that was done off our website. And all you need to know here is you see the red line. That's the, um, the child with BPD. And the mark underneath, if you can see it, is another sibling. And all of these fighting, difficulty making friends, sexual abuse, physical abuse, you go all down these things. It's so much more skewed by the child that they see at risk as opposed to a sibling. So what are the hallmarks of BPD? Self-injury. Um, and um, first of all, let's look at self-injury as non-suicidal. That doesn't mean that people who do self-injure don't have a higher likelihood of making a suicide attempt. But for some, it, it's not related to suicide. So what is um, non-suicidal self-injury? It's a deliberate injury to one's body without the intention to die. The behavior has strong positive correlation with completed suicide through the lifespan. It often has damaging effects on current and future relationships. And fundamentally, it's an effective short-term solution to long-term problems. Hard for all of us to think of it that way, but it works, unfortunately. It brings down the emotional intensity of that individual. And this is taken from Michael Hollander's um, presentation last month in San Juan, and he has a book out about cutting, if anyone wants more information. So what's the prevalence of self-injury? So there are several studies out. In high schools, you can see it ranges anywhere from 18% down to almost 14%. And in college and university students, 12% uh, up to 35% are self-injuring. So the age of onset of self-injury is between the ages of 11 and 14. The evidence from community samples indicates that an equal number of boys and girls self-injure, which I don't think we think about. And in clinic populations, girls, though, are overrepresented, because that's who's more likely to come for treatment than boys. 
Included are cutting, burning, scratching, some forms of skin picking and breaking bones. But it's not tattoos, piercing, eating disorder behavior, substance abuse, um, I have those twice. Oh, substance abuse and eating disorders can have similar functions, um, but they're not considered um, self-injury. So now we come to the big thing, and I think this is what people dread the most, is suicide. I don't think I've ever sat with a family that this hasn't been what's foremost in their mind, is that this is what they dread so much. So suicide is a crisis. It's the second leading cause of death for um, kids between 15 to 24. It's the fourth leading cause of death from 5 to 14. Can you imagine that kids as young as 5 are killing themselves? An estimated 12% of U.S. adolescents will contemplate suicide. Four will make a plan to kill themselves, and 4.1 will actually make an attempt. In 2011 alone, over 4,000 adolescents died by suicide, and up to 39% of teens who killed themselves have BPD or BPD traits. So that's from the person with the disorder. What's the impact like on families? What are families told? So they bring their child to see a mental health professional, and they're told it's just adolescence. Or it's only teenage behavior, and she or he will outgrow it. The diagnosis can't be made until the age of 18. And of course, my favorite is it's bipolar disorder. So if it's bipolar disorder, you can be sure they're on medication. You're be, you can be sure that they're not getting the treatment that they need. And until recently, they weren't learning coping skills. I think now more they are. Um, DBT has gone way beyond borderline personality disorder, so they're probably getting coping skills. The focus on the family is different when it's bipolar disorder versus when it's borderline personality disorder. So what do adolescent families live with? Frequent emotional storms, frequent reactive emotions, poor impulse control, risky and suicide, uh, impulsive and risky behaviors, self-injury as we talked about. What do families fear and fear feel? So in San Juan, we had a wonderful mom and daughter to talk to um, the audience. And what the mom said is, she said, I live in terror. And I think that family members who walk this path absolutely <laughs> identify that with that word, terror. There's also grief, burden, depression, surplus stigma, and now we are finding also post-traumatic stress disorder. So what does that mean? Well, let me first show you, this is um, one of the endorsements from our book um, that came out in 2005. So let's say this endorsement was probably written in 2004 before it went into publication. But it talks about the, how families, friends, and caregivers of people with BPD have long been neglected by mental health professionals. Blamed, censured, stigmatized, they've been relegated to the anteroom of treatment, rarely being considered as a positive force to be harnessed for effective intervention. Involving families in treatment resurrects hope from despair and is likely to improve treatment outcomes and maintain constructive family involvement. I think we've come to this finally. I think now um, most people who are working with people with the disorder, certainly with adolescents, are involving the families. But this is um, 13 years later. So who are these families? So early history described them as inconsistent, neglectful, pathological, abuse, and my favorite was that there should be parentectomies, and that the parents should be kept away from their child. <coughs> but thank goodness there's more recent thinking. And initially considered a disorder of conflicts, BPD is now understood in the context of deficits. The infant child has certain predisposing vulnerabilities and temperaments that requires a unique parenting style that doesn't come naturally to most people. Um, John Gunderson said that it wasn't until that he had adolescence himself, his own children, that he realized, you know what, there's something else that's going on here. This is not an easy road, just with a typical adolescent. So those who are at the extreme, we don't have skills for that. So very important, the attention shifted from blame to need. We're not blaming families. We know families need things. So very quickly, this is a, a diagram that I came up with. Are parents villains? Are they victims? Or should we be seeing them as allies, which we should? 
So you can just see that this is a, the dilemmas that family members go through. In the beginning, in the middle is hope versus despair. They go back from the polarity to being feeling hopeful to then feeling despair. And if you look at the right, they go from minimizing what might happen to catastrophizing something. They go from blaming the parent to blaming themselves. They go from family needs to individual needs. And there's a little video on this that will flesh that out a little more. They, the family members go from an enabling their relative um, to supporting them so that there's a contrast between what is support and what is enabling. They go from being withholding and neglectful to being emotionally over-involved. And they go from seeing the uh, patient as fragile or sometimes the patient as terrorist because they're so frightened by what's going on. So more recent thinking says that we need a special skill set for families. And psychoeducation and skill strategies have emerged as the central modality now. Uh, today, the family is seen as an important part of patient recovery. And this is particularly relevant with adolescents. So I'm just going to share with you a few family situations. This is um, mom and dad and three kids. Um, and the mom presented at, we've done 14 annual conferences at Yale University, and this was last year. And the mom is a, of, of a teenage son. She said, we live a life of drama. And then she tells this story about her son cutting himself um, while he was in bed. So his mattress was filled with blood. So she said, tell me, how do you get a mattress out of the house without the police being called? You don't leave it on the curb, right? Neighbors will drive by and think, what's going on in this house? She said, this is what's going on for us. She said, there's been a lot of creative self-harm, and clinicians treated him like a curiosity. She said, and this is her message to clinicians, please know how alone we feel. Please know we need your help. Don't misdiagnose our children as bipolar. And please don't expect a positive answer to the question, do you ever feel empty? Rather ask, do you ever feel lonely? OK, so this is, oh, you know what? It's jumping ahead. So this is the next family. This is a mom and dad with their uh, three children, also a son with the disorder. But what I want you to listen to here is how the mom had to make a decision of what was in the best interest for her son and what was in the best interest of her family. There were a couple of years that were um, my worst nightmares. I was at work one day and my husband called me and he said, you have to come home, we have a problem. My daughter had been in the house and EJ was downstairs and um, was doing some things uh, that scared her. Uh, and when my husband came home and confronted um, him, he just went into a rage. When we asked EJ to leave, um, it was really because we had other kids. And we had to get our home back. Um, and if he couldn't be part of it, then he, he couldn't be part of it. This mom became a family connections leader, and she's still, she's so funny the way she does this, because so she, she and her partner run, run groups all the time. And in the summer, because they live on a lake, they take them out on their boats. And I said, oh, I want to come to that. That sounds like a nice way to do family connections. But um, this last Mother Day, Mother's Day, her son forwarded me a note, and he said, thank you for giving my, me my mom back because she knew how to interact with him, and she knew how to be effective. She um, used her family connection skills, obviously, very well. So let's also look at a family's initial welcome to the word of borderline, world of borderline personality disorder. This was on Time magazine. Borderline personality disorder, the disorder that doctors fear the most. Well, that's something that brings you comfort if you're a parent. So this is the A family, mom and dad um, and their daughter. And actually, this mom and this daughter are going to be speaking at our congressional briefing in November. Things have come such a long way that we want to show um, the daughter identifies that she uh, was suicidal at the age of nine. But we want to show what can be done if we can get in early. 
So if there is a pearl you take home, as Susan said, at least one, I'm, hopefully meant, I'm hoping many more, please go home and know that this is a hopeful disorder, okay? This is not a death sentence. We just need to get our youngsters into the right treatment early enough. When I was nine, I would have like these huge temper tantrums and it became really hard for me to do anything. Feeling like there's something wrong with me and that I'm innately flawed um, was part of what I think made it so hard. I mean, I, I was nine and I was contemplating suicide. She was so sad and so hollow, and I don't know that you would even be able to fathom that seeing her now. There was nothing there. There was... She just basically given up. <laughs> This part is my most uh, passionate clip. And every year we do a um, program at the, the American Psychiatric Association with the residents. It's been 10 years now. We do it with Dr. John Gunderson and several other people. But I want those residents to know what family members go through. I think they're probably scared of the family members, but I think if they can have some compassion and understanding that this is a nightmare for family members, we maybe can begin to turn the tide by training our mental health professionals um, about the disorder from a different way. We held a Family Connections training in Atlanta, Georgia, and this is what somebody said. A mom said, the doctor said, there's nothing I can do for your daughter. A father said, the doctor whispered quietly in my ear, borderline personality. Sitting in a room with 50 family members with relatives of individuals with borderline personality disorder is witness to ongoing trauma. I was, um, Susan ran that training with her sister and I was uh, sitting in the back and just the passion and the pain in that room was striking. So I started to think, because also I'm a clinician and I sit with family members and there's one mom um, when we'll be in session never turns off her phone and I know that every parent with a child with BPD leaves their phone on and the phone, every time the phone rings I could see something was happening to her. She was, she was lost in the session. We changed the ringtone but it didn't matter. But I thought, you know, what there's something else going on here this looks like post-traumatic stress disorder so we did a re re research on over about 475 families we found that a hundred percent of them had one at least one potentially traumatic event involving their BPD relative so the questions that they asked were around the BPD symptoms 84 percent of them met criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder and what was interesting is the trauma on the family members is not the usual way trauma is defined. For example, it wasn't about physical assault, sexual assault, etc. Rather, the BPD behaviors such as suicide, suicidal and injurious, injurious behavior, uh, fears of abandonment were the prevalent traumatic events. Suicide attempts are particularly traumatic for family members. This type of trauma family mem members identify as the most distressing event and what I thought was very interesting the relationship to the ill relative was not relevant it was the event that was the issue so if it was a sibling they were as traumatized as a parent was so it's these events caused by the symptoms of the behavior and this is just the chart that showed the other things so what's the family member's impact on recovery? We know this is a disorder that happens in the context of relationships. If someone were out on an island, they wouldn't have these symptoms because they play against another person. So I did a study, I wanted to, there's a construct called expressed emotion which uh, taps the attitudes and beliefs about a family member and you, you ask a family member certain questions and then it's coded by a trained rater. Um, it's been done with all the psychiatric diagnoses. Schizophrenia was the first, bipolar disorder, depression, eating disorders, you can run the gamut. Okay, BPD was the only one that had this finding that the more emotionally involved, and I put the word over in there because when you have an ill child, you are involved. I don't know what's over about being involved, but what we found was the more involved a family member is, the better that patient did. So that's 
what we need to be doing is helping family members stay the course with their relative. There are two programs that we've done. One is called DBT Family Skills Training. That was done way back when, when DBT first came out. Um, I was learning it, and I thought, my gosh, these, we all could use these skills. So I was on an inpatient unit running a family group, and I said, let's teach these families these skills. And that was the first one DBT was used with families. And then there's Family Connections, which we're going to go more into. Um, the person who's now the CEO of Behavioral Tech, which is Marshall Linehan's Institute, and that's where DBT, um, you know, the center of DBT, he said that uh, DBT has uh, saved lives, and he says family connections has changed families. So that's what we hope to get the message out and, and do. Um, I'm not going to go into what it is. I just want to quickly show you the the. Um, the, the, the data on it. So what we found out that family connections, family members pre and post, the grief goes down, and then three months later the grief continues to go down because family members use the skills. Just uh, depression and uh, distress, same thing, goes down, continues to go down after three months post completion. Burden, same thing, goes down and three months later continues to go down. And what's so nice is that mastery goes up, which, which means that family members feel, feel, feel more skilled in being able to interface with their loved one. And that is crucial because family, when you feel disempowered or de-skilled, you can't do anything. If you have skills and you can refer to them, you feel like you can manage things in a better way, which helps you in your emotional state. And that's the goal of Family Connections. It's not about getting the relative better, it's about the family member being able to feel more centered. Um, we have replications, um, and I won't go into all of them, but what's most exciting, I think, is um, the one that's just come out, this was done out in Reno, Nevada. It was done on a, in a residential program. It was done with the adolescent and the family members. And what it showed was that the family members, the, the, all that data I just showed you was replicated, but their, but their adolescent got better too. And it was controlled for everything else that might have impacted that. So this is the first data that does come out now that family members can help the ill relative. Because actually, we're teaching family members new ways of communicating. And again, it's a relationship disorder. So that has to show that that's going to improve the uh, ill relative. And this was what I was just telling you. So now I'm going to turn it over to Susan, who is the guru of family connections, not only in Atlanta, but she has gone to Florida to teach people. Uh, where else did you go, Susan? To Los Angeles, Virginia. Where? Washington, D.C. And now she said to me, she said, I want to go to Europe. So we said yes. So <laughs> we've got to, and we're, we get requests all over the world for the course. So we'll get Susan to spread the word in Europe someplace. Thank you.